Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang, and moving on from the Seven Days Battles. And McClellan, even though winning the last battle, tucking away with his tail between his legs, and ultimately his army getting replaced by the Army of the Virginia to start a new campaign to try to take Richmond, which doesn't end very well for uh, Pope. doesn't end well for Pope in that battle either, but um be a while before Richmond gets taken, boys, so just hold on to your hats, because the uh, South is about to invade the North and get pretty damn close to Washington, so we've got a lot of fun stuff coming up, but first today we'll have the Battle of Donaldsonville, the Battle of Cedar Mountain, the Battle of New Aces. And Copton's Ferry as well to end it out. First one, Donaldsonville took place August 9th, 1862 in Ascension Parish in Louisiana as part of the operations against Baton Rouge in the American Civil War. Number of incidents of artillery firing on Union steamers passing up and down the Mississippi at Donaldsonville influenced the U.S. Navy to undertake a retali retaliatory attack. Uh oh. Where Admiral David G. Farragut, or Gut, Sent the town notice of its intentions and suggested that the citizens send the women and children away. Why are the men? The men are like, what? I don't want to be part of this either. Right. He then anchored in front of the town and fired upon it with guns and mortars. Uh -oh. Farragut also sent a detachment ashore that set fire to the hotels, wharf buildings, and the dwelling houses and other buildings of Captain Philip e. Landry. Landry, thought to be the captain of the partisan unit, purportedly fired on the landing party during the raid. Some citizens protested the raid, but generally firing on Union ships ceased thereafter. Oh. And that's the battle down on some mill. Oh, look at that shit. <laughs> that's the yeah, worked out. He's like, I'm going to show your town. You yeah. better stop attacking us. All right. That was that. Hmm. Well, better Cedar Mountain. Jeez. <laughs> also known as <laughs> Slaughter's Mountain. Oh. Or Cedar Run. Mm. This took place on August 9th, 1862. Same day. Call Pepper County, Virginia. Right. No. Yep. Same day. Call Pepper County, Virginia. Union forces under Major General Nathaniel P. Banks. Hey. They attacked Confederate forces under Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. Hey. There, that was near Cedar Mountain as the Confederates marched on Culpeper Courthouse mm -hmm. to forestall a Union advance into Central Virginia. Yep, yep. 26th of June earlier, Major General John Pope was placed in the command of the newly uh, Army of Virginia. We know that. Which was right after the uh, right. Battle of Malvern Hill. Pope deployed his army in an arc across Northern Virginia. Its right flank under Major General Franz Siegel was positioned at Sperryville on the Blue Ridge Mountains. In the center, under George, under Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, uh, was located at Little Washington. And at its left, under Major General Irvin McDowell, was at Falmouth on the Rappahannock River. Okay, so I got he's, he's panned out there over there. Good. In an arc, as it said, yes. <laughs> Part of the Banks Corps, Brigadier General Samuel W. Crawford's brigade and Brigadier General John P. Hatch's cavalry were stationed 20 miles beyond the Union line at Culpeper Courthouse. Yes, Culpeper Courthouse. Okay. Well, General E. Lee responded to Pope's dispositions by dispatching Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson with 14,000 men to Gordonsville on July 13th. Nice. Look at Jackson was later reinforced with another 10,000 men by Major General A.P. Hill's division oh, on July 27th. A.P. Hill, man. I'm tired of seeing nice. these guys. Jackson getting the army. Lee intended to have Jackson strike Pope's Army of Virginia before the Army of the Potomac could reinforce them. Right. August 6th, Pope marches forces south into Culpeper County with the objective of capturing the rail junction at Gordonsville in an attempt to draw Confederate attention away from Major General George B. McClellan's withdrawal from the Virginia Peninsula. Okay. Well, in spots of this threat, Stonewall Jackson chose to go on the offensive, attacking Pope's vanguard under Banks before the entire Army of Virginia could be brought to bear on his position at Gordonville. I, mean, I guess. After defeating Banks, he then hoped to move on to Culpeper Courthouse, 26 miles north of Gordonsville, and the focal point of the Union Arc uh, of uh, Northern Virginia. It's like, if we get that, we can knock hold this whole threat away there, buds. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's like, we do that. These guys can't unite. They can't right. get stronger. We can move on with our plan. Right. This would allow Jackson to fight and hopefully defeat each of the Union Corps separate, separately, as he had done during the Valley Campaign. He's like, it worked then. Why can't it right. work now? And he goes, Shenandoah, we did this shit. It could work here. So that's what Jackson's problem was, I think, with the Seven Days Battles, because he was under, he had to take orders from Lee specifically right, right there, right. where in the Valley Campaign, he was doing everything by himself pretty much, and now he's doing it again. Right. 
As in his campaign in Shenandoah in the spring, Jackson would maneuver nimbly enough to gain local numerical superiority in the coming action. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The cavalry under Brigadier General Beverly Robertson was sent ahead to dispatch the federal cavalry guarding the fords of the Rap- Rapidon River and occupying Madison Courthouse, threatening the Confederates' left flank as they marched northward. Mm. This task was easily accomplished by Robertson on the 8th of August. Easily. Easily. Jackson's march on the Culpeper Courthouse was hindered by the severe heat wave over Virginia at the beginning of August. Yeah, as well as by his characteristic secrecy about his plan, which caused confusion among his divisional commanders as to the exact route of advance. Well, what an idiot. All right. As such, the head of his column only had progressed eight miles by the evening of August 8th. Well, federal cavalry, though easily dispatched by Robertson, quickly returned to Pope and alerted him of the Confederate advance. In response, Pope ordered Siegel to call Pepper Courthouse to reinforce Banks, and Banks was ordered to maintain a defensive line on a ridge above Cedar Run, about seven miles south of Call Pepper Courthouse. Okay. Banks, who was still smarting from defeat, oh, yeah, because Jackson whooped his ass in the valley, right. was anxious for revenge. Instead of fighting a defensive battle to buy time of rest for the Army's arrival, for the rest of the Army's arrival, he planned to take the initiative and attack Jackson attack. before he could fully form his lines, despite being outnumbered two to one. He said, man, I hate this Jackson guy. I can't let, I'm not going out like a bitch. Damn right he's not. Well, maybe he is. <laughs> maybe. Well, <laughs> maybe morning, he is. Right? Morning of August 9th, Jackson's army crossed the Rip Head out. Jackson's army crossed the Rapidan River into Culpeper County, led by Major General Richard S. Ewell's division, followed by Brigadier General Charles S. Winder's division with Major General A.P. Hill's division in the rear. Just before noon, Brigadier General Jubal Early's brigade, the vanguard of Ewell's division, came upon Federal cavalry and artillery occupying the ridge above Cedar Run, just to the northwest of Cedar Mountain. Okay. As stated before, Virginia was in the middle of an August heat wave. Yeah. By 14 hundo, it was 98 degrees. PM, 98 degrees. And dude. fighting did not commence until 1530. 330. The okay. peak of the day's heat. I bet. Probably like over a hundo. Early in the contest, Jackson. And they're all wearing, wearing like wool and shit. shit. Yeah, mm-hmm. gotten. Early early in the contest, Jackson's Army's movements were greatly hindered by this heat. Bet. The initial action consisted of a nearly two-hour artillery duel, with neither side gaining a clear advantage. Some artillerymen suffered heat stroke as they frenetically fired their guns. The effect of federal artillery fire plunging around the Crittenden Gate had severely disrupted the Confederate deployment. I'm sure it would. Well. Uh, Early brought up his guns and an artillery duel began between the opposing forces as Early's infantry formed a line on the eastern side of the Culpeper Orange Turnpike, which runs roughly parallel to present day U.S. Route 15. Right. On the high ground on the opposite bank of Cedar Run. As the rest of Ewell's division arrived, they formed on Early's right, anchored against the northern slope of the mountain, and deployed their six guns on its ridge. Hey. Winder's division or Winder's division formed to Early's left and the west side of the turnpike with Brigadier General William Taliaferro's brigade closest to Early, Colonel Thompson S. Garnett's on the far Confederate left, and a wheat field at the edge of a woods. Yeah, what are you going to do, right? Edge of a woods. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do? Winder's artillery filled a gap on the road between the two divisions. The Stonewall Brigade, led by Colonel Charles R. Ronald. I think it's Winder. The Stonewall Brigade, led by Colonel Charles R. Ronald, was brought up in support behind the guns. A.P. Hill's division, still marching up the turnpike, was ordered to stand in in reserve on the Confederate left. A little before 1700, as the artillery battle, as the artillery fight began to wane, Confederate Brigadier General Charles S. Winder fell mortally wounded. Oh, Winder. He had been ill that day and was taken onto the field in an ambulance wagon. <laughs> well, he was like, I still want to go to the field, though. While attempting to direct his troops, he was struck by a shell fragment. Mm. Winder's left arm and side were torn to pieces. He died a few hours later. Yeah, dude. As a result, commanding division devolved on William Telefero, who was completely ignorant of Jackson's battle plan. <laughs> Dispos- dispositions on his part of the field were still incomplete. Garnett's brigade was isolated from the main Confederate line with its flank dangerously exposed to the woods. Mm -hmm. The Stonewall Brigade was to have come up to support them, but remained a half a mile distant behind artillery. Before leadership could properly be restored to the division, the Union attack began. It began. The Federals formed a line on a ridge above Cedar Run with Brigadier General Samuel W. W. Crawford's brigade forming the Reunion right in a field across from Garnett. Brigadier General Christopher C. Auger's division on the Union left to the east of the turnpike. Brigadier General John W. Gary's brigade was anchored on the turnpike opposing Talia Farrow, while Brigadier General Henry Prince's brigade formed the far left opposite Ewell. 
Brigadier General George S. Green's understrength brigade, only two regiments, was kept in the reserve. Due to Banks' effective artillery fire, many Southerners were still struggling to get in position when he set his infantry forward. Right. He led off with General Christopher Auger's division, which launched an attack through the fields east of the Culpeper Road. Gary and Prince were sent against the Confederate right, and they're oh. like, it's time to go, boys. Who is she? The Federal advance was swift, threatened to break the Confederate line, prompting early to come galloping to the front from Cedar Mountain, where he is directing troop dispositions. Auger sent his first two brigades in two massive lines forward through a thick cornfield. Rebel batteries on his left on the slope of Cedar Mountain across the south branch of Cedar Run open up with solid shot into his blue ranks in the corn. Mm. Ah, so you can see blue all day in that right. corn. The firing intensified as they neared the Confederate lines. I'm sure it would. <laughs> the artillery kept up a galling fire. A small depression and a split rail fence shielded Early's men. Mm. And the Federals were fighting without much cover except for the corn stalks. And they were getting the worst of the shooting match, including Auger himself, who received a wound in the foot. Oh, oh shot me in my foot. Shot me in my foot. Early stabilizing presence and the raking fire of the Confederate guns halted the Union advance on the Confederate right side. On the left side, Crawford attacked Winder's division, sending three of his regiments directly across the wheat field, while six companies of the 3rd Wisconsin from the brigade led by Brigadier General George Henry Gordon they advanced on Crawford's right flank through an overgrown bushy field just west of the wheat field. Crawford's assault rapidly crossed the wheat field while the attention of Garnett's men was occupied by Gary and Prince's attack on the Confederate right. The Federals crashed into the woods directly into the flank oh, of the 1st Virginia Infantry Battalion, who, under the pressure from attack on two fronts, broke for the rear. Uh, the Federals pushed on, not wanting to reform their lines, rolling through the outflanked 42nd Virginia until they found themselves in Talia Farrell's and the artillery's rear. Right. Just as Crawford's assault had begun, the Stonewall Brigade had come up on Garnett's left and formed their line along the southern end of the bushy field. They're like, Ugh. almost breaking through. All right. A gap, however, still remained between Stonewall Brigade and Garnett's Brigade, and Crawford's men streamed through the gap. Taylor Farrow had sent the 10th Virginia from his own brigade to help support Garnett's left, but they too were rapidly forced to withdraw. Hmm. Unaware of the disaster to his right, Colonel Ronald ordered the Stonewall Brigade forward in the bushy field routing the vastly outnumbered 3rd Wisconsin in a matter of minutes. Oh, look at that. North ain't usually getting routed. About to pursue the retreating Federals, Ronald suddenly learned the right flank of his brigade, held by the 27th Virginia, had fled when they discovered Crawford's men in the woods to their right and rear. What? Mm, of course, man. Stonewall ordered the batteries withdrawn before they could be captured. But Taylor Farrow and Early's left were hit hard by Crawford's advance and threatened to break. They threatened to uh -oh. break. All you got to do is bend, though. Right. Well, at this dire point, General Jackson rode to that part of the field to rally the men and came upon members of the 27th Virginia, part of what he had once been that had once been in his old brigade. Intended to inspire the troops there, he attempted to brandish his sword. However, due to the infrequency of, what the, of which he drew it, it had rusted in its scabbard and he was unable to dislodge it. <laughs> Undaunted, he unbuckled the sword from his belt and waved it, scabbard and all, over his head. He then grabbed a battle flag from a retreating standard bearer and yelled at his men to rally around him. All right. Look at you, Stonewall. Right. The rally, and they 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 uh, respond to you by shooting you later on. Huh? <laughs> Idiots. The rally troops joined with advancing reinforcements from AP Hill's division to blunt Crawford's advance. Meanwhile, having learned of the collapse of the Garnett's position in the route of the 27th Virginia, Colonel Ronald, or, Ronald, Colonel Ronald ordered the Stonewall Brigade's remaining four regiments to wheel to the right, bringing their battle line into the western end of the wheat field in Crawford's rear. Okay, whatever, right? Under pressure in the front from fresh troops of Brigadier General Lawrence O'Brien Branch's brigade and with Stonewall's brigade about to cut them off from the rest of the Union Army, Crawford's men began streaming back through the wheat field. Like, yeah, we got to turn around. An advance by the 5th Virginia resulted in the capture of large numbers of Federals, as well as three Union battle flags. Oh, oh damn. Don't get them flags. So Pen and thought combined cannot do this subject justice, recall a captain in the 5th Connecticut. It was as if men had deliberately walked into a fiery furnace, and I only wonder how many escaped from certain death upon that field. Mm. Wow. That, that was also a captain in the 5th Connecticut. Oh, same guy. Crawford ordered his final reserve regiment, the 10th Maine, to hold off the Confederates long enough for the rest of the brigade to withdraw. Standing alone against elements of three Confederate brigades, the 461-man regiment lost 179 in wow. a fight that some survivors claimed lasted as little as five minutes. I'm sure did. Damn. These people just mowing down. With the Union right flank disintegrating, 
Gordon was ordered to advance his brigade, including the now reformed elements of the third Wisconsin routed earlier, um, establishing their position line along the tree line on the Northern edge of the wheat field. Gordon's three regiments held against attacks by Stonewall brigade, branches brigade, and additional reinforcements under general Brigadier general James Archer. The Confederates, however, were only holding Gordon's attention while additional fresh troops worked their way west around Gordon's right flank. Okay. With little warning, parts of the Stonewall Brigade and the brigade led by Brigadier General William D. Pender smashed into the flank of the 27th Indiana. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. The advancing Confederates blazed a withering volley into the faces of our men on their right, recalled one of the Indiana soldiers. <laughs> Following the volley, they charged literally into the midst of the 27th Indiana flanks companies. And at the point of the bayonet, demanded their surrender. Oh, I'm sure they did. That's some freaking gladiator shit right there. <laughs> Gordon's line was quickly rowed up from the right to the left, and his men streamed for the rear. Meanwhile, Stonewall had ordered Ewell to advance as well. Ewell, having difficulty silencing his guns, was delayed, but the Union left began to waver at the sight of Crawford's retreat and were finally broken by a charge down Cedar Mountain by Brigadier General Isaac R. Trimble's brigade. Look at this. Uh, anyway, the uh, Union's on their heels for the first time in a while. Right, well, besides the whole McClellan thing. Right now. Yeah. Despite bringing up Green's Reserve Brigade in support by 1945, the Union line was in full retreat. In a last-ditch effort to help cover his infantry's retreat, Banks sent two squadrons of cavalry at the Confederate line. They were met with a devastating volley from the Confederate infantry posted behind a fence on the road, allowing only 71 of 174 to escape. Wow. Oh. The Confederate Infantry and Brigadier General William E. Jones's 7th Virginia Cavalry hotly pursued the retreating Federals, nearly capturing Banks and Pope. Jeez, dude. Dude, well, this is Pope's first goal right. with the Army of Virginia, and he's, he's all, almost going to This capture. is what's happening. Holy shit. They were at their headquarters. It was only a mile behind the Federal line. After a mile and a half of pursuit, Jackson grew wary as darkness set in, as he was unsure of the location of the rest of Pope's Army. All right. Finally, several Union infantrymen captured by the 7th Virginia Cavalry informed the Confederates that Pope was bringing Siegel forward to reinforce Banks. Accordingly, Jackson called off the pursuit, and around 2020, 2020, yeah, around 2200, the fighting had seized. Mm. Damn. Fighting well into the dark. 10 o'clock at night. Crazy. Uh, by this point, Brigadier General James Ricketts' division in McDowell's Corps was arriving, which effectively covered Banks' retreat. Okay. Yeah, so if, uh, if Jackson would have kept going forward, he would have been fucked, probably. Most likely. Losses were very high in this battle. Union casualties were 2,353, 314 killed, 1,445 wounded, 594 missing. Confederate Jeez. casualties were 1,338, 231 killed, 1,107 wounded. No missing. Hmm. Well, Crawford's brigade had lost over 50% of its total strength, including most of its officers. Princess and Geary's brigade suffered 30 to 40 percent casualty rates. Both generals were wounded. Prince was also captured. Jeez. Brigadier General Winder was mortally wounded by a shell. He did. He did. Claire Barton conducted her first field work ever after the battle. Well, no, not ever. But while she cared for her wounded soldiers in Washington D.C. on the battlefield after First Bull Run, the Department of the Army only authorized her visit to the front lines on August 3rd, 1862. After arrival on the 13th of August, Barton spent two days and nights on the battlefield tending to wounded, including Confederate prisoners. Jeez, dude. I mean, obviously, right? Jeez, you can look at Confederate guys. Know, nice. Maybe. For two days, Jackson maintained his position south of Cedar Run on the western slope of the mountain, waiting for a Federal attack that did not come. Lest further setbacks with Jackson on the loose, wrecking havoc. <laughs> Jackson on the loose. They right. were genuinely afraid of this guy. Dude. Oh, I know. That's ridiculous. Um, Union General in Chief Henry Halleck halted Pope's advance in Gordonsville, thereby surrendering initiative to Lee. With Pope now on the defensive, Lee could unleash his forces more broadly upon Pope. Finally, receiving news that all of Pope's army had arrived at Culpeper Courthouse on August 12th, Jackson fell back on Gordonsville to a more defensive position behind the Rapidan River. The battle effectively shifted fighting in Virginia from the Virginia Peninsula into northern Virginia. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Which means right there by Washington. Uh-oh. They're coming. Weather and poor communication with his divisional commanders had robbed Stonewall of the initiative in the fight. Still expecting to face the same cautious opponent from the valley, he was taken by surprise and very nearly driven from the field. Yeah, he, weren't, he wasn't. He was used to doing McClellan right. um, and his little things, and they're like, well, maybe we should just wait. Where Pope's like, no, we're sending Pope and Banks are like, we're coming at you. Excellent commanding by the Confederates at the crucial moment of the battle and the fortuitous arrival of Hill 
staved off defeat, yeah. eventually allowing their numerical superiority to drive the Federals from the field. For his part, Banks, having been soundly defeated by Jackson in the Valley, was anxious to make up for previous losses. Yeah, he did some stupid shit. Right. Instead of playing defense, right. he fucking went right in. Oh. What was that? What are you going to do? Rather than fighting a defensive battle from a strong position because he was outnumbered two to one, yep. given time for the rest of Pope's army to arrive, he decided to take initiative and, and, and attack Jackson before he could fully form his lines. I mean, smart thing, though, because Jackson didn't have his lines for him, so now would have been the time to attack, but he didn't have the army. Well, that bold move nearly paid off, but in the end, he was again defeated by his old foe. Damn. Pope's got to be feeling, or uh, Banks got to be feeling like a bitch right, right. now. Most of the already preserved land sits near the intersection of Virginia State Routes 15 and 657, the latter of which is known as General Winder Road. It includes the area where Crittenden and Gate once stood, okay. where Crittenden Gate once stood, right. along with the wheat field in which some of the bloodiest fight in the battle took place. Do you think that wheat field's still there? It should be. The trust preserved 152 acres of land there in 1998, added two more to that total 12 years later, and then 10 more by 2013. Local organization known as the Friends of Cedar Mountain Battlefield proved instrumental to implementing, yeah, whatever. The 10 acres saved in 2012 are close to Crittenden Gate site, where included the area of battlefield where General Wender was mortally wounded, oh. along with the locations of Jackson's command post and his desperate effort to rally Confederate troops at the climax of the battle. Okay, so they got Good. the important part of the battle there. Good, Good for them. Fantastic. New Aces. Right. <laughs> the New Aces Massacre. New Aces. Also known as the Massacre of New Aces was a violent confrontation between Confederate soldiers and German Texans. German Texans, not even in the war. Mm. This happened on August 10th, 1862 in Kinney County, Texas. Kinney County. Germans immigrated to Texas early as 1836. Yeah. By 1860, German population in Texas, predominantly first-generation immigrants, reached an approximate level of 20,000 across the entire state. It's pretty good. It's, yeah, it's a huge state, so it's not really it's pretty good. They settled heavily in an area known as the Hill Country. Of course. Yeah, because they... It's more like home. Is German yeah. hilly? I don't know. I'm thinking Ireland. <laughs> Germans probably, I mean, Bavarians, Bavarias, and stuff like that. It's right. probably like hilly so sides and shit. Flat. Right? The exact dimensions of hill country are not concrete. Okay. <laughs> Germans settled so heavily in this area that the counties of Gillespie, Kerr, Kendall, I think it's Kendall. Obviously. Gillespie, Kerr, Kendall, Medina, and Bexar comprised a German belt. It's all Germans. You don't want to go to that German place. Oh, shit. Well, during the antebellum period, Germans displayed a com complex set of opinions on slavery and secession. Right. There were several Germans who owned slaves and some eventually supported Texas secession from the United States. Of course they did. Most Germans, however, were apathetic to slavery. Why not? A vocal minority of Germans was actively antagonistic to the institution of slavery. These antagonistic Germans included liberal and Republican-minded Germans known as Ochtunverziger or 48ers. Okay. Many 48ers remain loyal to the United States and several oppose slavery. Okay. Most secessionists, Anglo Texans, found this to be an affront to their insurrection against the United States. German opposition to slavery led to an animosity between the two groups throughout the 1950s. Okay. These disputes were magnified by Texas secession in 1861 and the start of the war. Oh, shit. Germans getting pissed. Well, happen we all know what happens with Germans. <laughs> Nine! Now, upon the commencement of the war, Germans projected an outward appearance of passivity toward the conflict. They're like, meh. Confederate officials, however, saw the German population as an internal threat. Yeah, bet. The most adamant supporters of the Union were Tejanos. The Tejanos. And the German Texans, both from Central Texas and the counties of the Texas Hill Country. Hmm. They had some evidence for that suspicion during the statewide vote on succession. Germany, German heavy counties represented many of those along with abolitionists, northeast part of the state, to garner a majority vote against succession. They're right. like, all right, we know it's the abolitionists and those German heavy counties. Mm -hmm. Several reports in the beginning of 1862 even alleged that German communities celebrated Union victories. And? Who gives a shit? Right. The state government also feared German-run local militias. Oh, the Union Loyal League, organized by several 48ers, was one such militia. The actual purpose of the League is still a debated issue, though. Oh. Historians Robert Shook and Stanley McGowan acknowledge, as German Texans maintained at the time, that the group's express purpose was to defend the hill country from Indians and outlaws. Right. He's an Indian and outlaw. Confederates, they As go. German, half German. And, and, no, 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 full Indian. German living in country. Right. Confederates, they confirm, considered the Union Loyal League the enforcement arm of the German Unionist sentiment. Right. Sentiment. Confederate officers even implicated the organization in strategies to free Union soldiers from Camp Verde. I mean... 
I can understand the Confederates here, man. You're trying to create your own country. You can't have naysayers right. behind them. Behind, Especially and, and, 20 or a good number of right. Uh, right. Um, one side, right? You can't, do, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. With the need for more soldiers, the Confederates reestablished a draft. The Germans did not want to fight against the Union and objected to being drafted. Right. Build up to this event began in the spring of 1862 with the initiation of a Confederate conscription for Texans. Yep. Better sign up. To which many German Texans voiced their objection. The Confederate Conscription Act of 1862 turned General German objection into open opposition. Yep. Because of this opposition, General Hamilton B. dispatched Captain James Duff to Gillespie County. Late May 1862, Captain Duff imposed in martial law. There Remember is. this? Or that was in New Mexico, the martial mm -hmm. law. While in Gillespie County, Captain Duff arrested and executed two Germans. Oh, come on, Captain Duff. The harsh conduct convinced several Germans to leave Texas. That's what they wanted. Right. Frederick Fritsch Tegener, T-E-G-E-N-E-R, however you say it, whatever, and his Union Loyal League Associates planned a departure. They're like gone. Their goal was to enter Mexico. They were going to Old Mexico, they said. And then to make their way to Union Control New Orleans. Yeah, they ain't crossing Texas. That's uh, 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 like we'll, we'll, we'll take our chances around. in Mexico. <laughs> right. Uh, between August 1st and August 3rd, 1862, 61 German Texans led by Fritz Tegener, or Tegener departed from Turtle Creek, headed southwest for the Mexican border. Formed of their intentions, Captain Duff dispatched Lieutenant Why? Colin McRae with approximately 96 men in pursuit. Why? On August 3rd. Let these guys go. All right. August, well, then, because they're going to go to the Union side. So what? Well, after six days, Lieutenant McRae and his men spied the German Texans in a small prairie along the Nueces River on uh, August 9th. Lieutenant McRae then formulated an attack plan to commence later in the evening. Oh, wow. he, did divided, he divided his force into two companies to surround the camp. Approximately 1 a.m. Oh, they're coming in like the SWAT team right. going for a drug bust. Jeez. Except they'll come in like 4 a.m. Right. Approximately 1 a.m. on August 10th, the Confederates closed into the camp. At first, however, even surprise and planning did not favor the Confederates. Wow. Two Germans wandering from the camp encountered the force. Yeah, that's just how it goes. You know, them Germans are up all night drinking. Right. <laughs> The Confederates fired on these two Germans, which alerted the camp to us to the assault. Right. Thus alerted the Germans beat back the first Confederate. Thus alerted the Germans beat back the first Confederate charge. And we got a bunch of just Germans. I guess they're a part of militia, but I mean several Germans, however, were disheartened by the Confederate presence and fled the field. Numbers vary, but Stanley McGowan estimates that twenty three to twenty eight Germans fled throughout the early morning. Yeah, there's only like 70 something of them. This reduced the German contingent by over a third. So there's only like 90 something. A second charge closer to dawn routed the Germans. It led to the flight, serious incapitation, or death of all German combatants. Incapacitation. Right. Yeah, the Confederate losses out of the 96 man force counted two soldiers dead, 18 wounded, including Lieutenant McRae. Uh -huh. sure. Reports Lieutenant, on the uh, casualties for the vanquished Germans were sparse and inconclusive. Well, I would say most yeah, of them. Right. They're right. <laughs> They're no longer a thing. Yeah, 1962, historian Robert Shook tallied the German casualties at 30 killed and 20 wounded. More recent conclusion in 2003 made by historian Ralph Randolph Campbell is that 19 Germans died outright in the assaults. Okay. That, however, was not the final tally for the German Texans' losses because uh -oh. following the battle, Confederate soldiers killed nine badly wounded Germans outright. Oh, jeez. Cavalry men pursued nine more to the Rio Grande where they likewise killed the fleeing Germans. Oh, Look at wow. these fucking pussies. All right, you ain't kidding. The total German casualty report then comes to approximately 37 killed. Unknown totals for wounded among those who fled and survived. Oh, wow. That's sad. Just because they said let them, they should let them go. That's not even a crime of war, though, because these guys aren't technically a part of nothing. No. They're yeah. just, well, it's murder, though. That's well, treason. It's not treason. They weren't taking up arms against, they never took up arms against the government. Yeah, they, they were just leaving. Yeah, and then they did. They were just leaving. Yeah, but they had no choice when you're getting fired upon. Well, they did. You can't well, come. Uh, government... <laughs> Yes, they did. The government cannot barge in my house and shoot at me and then charge me for treason for shooting <laughs> yeah. at them back. Several Germans did survive the engagement and ensuing manhunt. These combatants either hid out in Texas, fled to Mexico and California, or eventually joined Union forces in New Islands as members of the Union First Texas Cavalry. Mm. More important, however, was how the incident affected the German community in Texas for the rest of the war. They're like, get the fuck out of here. Right. They're like, ooh. Uh, Maybe we should have not stopped in Texas. Like, why did she come to Texas anyway? Right. Why don't we follow? Uh... Right. Though Confederate actions met with some ire and loud objections from other German Texans, the incident marked the general end to avert German unionism in Texas for the remainder of the war. Anybody that was was like secretive. That's for right. sure. They were like, we ain't I'm not German. Nothing. I'm not German. I'm not supporting the union, at least. Right. 
Upon secession of hostile hostilities in 1865, Germans emerged as some of the most exuberant celebrants of the Union victories. Of course, oh, you know, they were dancing in the streets, dancing right. in the street. German language, Truer der Union Monument, Monument, Loyalty to the Union, which it means, in Comfort, Texas, was dedicated August 10th, 1866. Oh, shit. Uh, dedicated to the Nueces massacre victims. Oh. With the exception of those drowned in the Rio Grande, the remains of the deceased are buried at the site of the monument. Damn, they drowned them in, in the Rio Grande? Too. How they know that? It was the only monument to unionism dedicated by locals in former Confederate territory. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Look at Texas. That is true. You go down south, there's no union monuments. There's no Confederate monument. Well, there's Confederate monuments in yeah. Washington, D.C., though. Right. Confederate figures, at least. Right. One title for an incident, the Battle of New Aces or the New Aces Massacre, has been a contested issue since the engagement itself. Right. It wasn't a battle. Right. Recently, historian Stanley McGowan has addressed both sides of the debate. He recognized that the Germans were, judging by their ability to repulse a superior force that was well armed. No, they were well armed. Oh, and they were well armed. The initial engagement, he affirms, he be called the Battle. Yeah, when they first snuck up on them and the right. they they repulsed the first attack, but right. then it just turned into an all-out massacre. Right. It can be called the Battle of New Aces, the first. But the execution of Germans following the battle, he states, lends credence to the title New Aces Massacre. Right. No name has garnered definitive support. And McGowan admits the debate on Confederate and German action still goes on among descendants on both sides of the incident. So so if you go to this part of Texas, well, yeah, like that, a Hatfield and McCoy type thing right, going on. I bet. And German. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet, bud. Well, that was the New Aces massacre. Fucking Confederates. Right. Uh, leads us to the final battle of the day. The battle of Compton's Ferry, also known as Little Compton Ferry. That occurred during or along the Grand River in Livingston County on August 10th through the 13th. Okay. Colonel John A. Poindexter and his force of 1,200 to 1,500 Confederate recruits were caught at Compton Ferry along the Grand River by forces under Union Colonel Odin Guitar. Hey! Nice. In seven, that's the first we're hearing about this guy, huh? All right. In seven days, Guitar's force, it could be Guitar or Guitar or something, maybe. Guitar. But as I'm saying a Guitar because that's how you spell it. In seven days, Guitar's forces pursued Poindexter's for 250 miles and attacked the guerrilla forces three times. Oh, okay. shit. They were confronted at Switzler's Mill, Little Compton, and on the Muscle Fork of the Charlton Cheriton River. Here, the Federals caught the rebels in the act of crossing the river. Oh, they're sitting ducks then. Causing a great havoc and sending them into the headlong retreat. Two Union artillery pieces fired a total of eight rounds. That's it. Producing the route. Oh, a large wow. amount of material was recovered. Okay. During the battle, 150... <clears throat> During the battle, 150 Confederate soldiers were wounded, killed, or drowned. Another 100 soldiers were taken prisoner. The Union forces fared much better, with only five men being wounded and ten horses being killed. Well, what's more important, horses or men? Right. <laughs> Guitar's forces numbered 550. Counts of the battle were gruesome. Soldiers attempted to escape. Many discarded their guns and plunged with their horses into the river. Hmm. Some of the horses were able to return to shore, but many drowned. A number of soldiers with their baggage, horses, mules, guns, and wagons were captured. The converging Union forces of Guitar and Benjamin Lone continued to pursue Poindexter's men immediately after this action, dealing them a crippling blow at the Battle of Yellow Creek. We'll get to that. The wounded Colonel Poindexter was captured on September 1st, wearing civilian clothing. Pussy. <laughs> like they didn't know. The result of this battle and subsequent battle at Yellow Creek was the effective suppression of the Confederate recruiting efforts and major guerrilla operations north of the Mizzou, that's the river, Missouri River, in the northwest portion of the states. Following the battles at Compton's Ferry, Yellow Creek, and other sites, and others. Right. <laughs> Governor Gamble promoted Colonel Guitar to Brigadier General of Enrolled Missouri Militia. Well, good for him. Good look at the guitar. Look at, them. They, look at it. Poindexter was on his ass going, bye bye bye. He said, General Guitar, you keep strumming along. <laughs> <laughs> you hit a lick, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a good one. Uh, yeah, I guess we had one decent little battle of the um, Battle of Cedars Mountain was a decent little one, and the other ones were just right. straight up a one a massacre, and the other ones just nothing. Right. Um, hey, that's what you're gonna get because um, never know, but we got little battles leading up to little battles. <laughs> <laughs> These little battles lead up to other little battles, right? And then those little battles lead up to big battles sometimes, right? 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 Right, right. right. <laughs> it's like August twelfth. We made about ten days away. <laughs> about, 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 ten days. about ten days away from second bowl run, which is like August twenty second, I think. Um, but before that, we got another battle, the Manassas 
bridge or, or Manassas train line or something before leading up immediately before right. the Battle of Manassas Part Two, and um, that'll be our big battle <laughs> <laughs> of the yeah. year. <laughs> our big battle of the year, right. and then um, middle on to eighteen sixty three, which is a lot of major battles. We got some Pennsylvania action. I mean, that's, well, that. that's what I'm saying. After after Manassas Part Two, Part Two, um, well, that's when Lee's like, you know what, boys? I think we could take this battle to the north, uh, and that's when the north starts getting invaded, and some serious shit goes on for another two years. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, and obviously, we'll have it all right here on Battles of the American Civil War. In the meantime. Go check out. It's a big, it's a big, 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 big week in um, Outlaws and Gunslingers realm of the world because we are covering the JFK assassination, <gasps> which is the 20, no, what was it? 49th, 59th, 49th anniversary? Something like that. 59th anniversary, 63, 59th, 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 59th anniversary of the assassination. It's probably going to be a two parter, but this will be the first week of it. Leading all the way up from uh, probably the assassination, and then we'll probably stop right after that before we get into the investigations Ooh, and the conspiracies uh, and all that good stuff you know in that. part two. But uh, yeah, big episode, uh, big episodes for Outlaws and Gunslingers they for even that. They made movies to try to mock the conspiracies. Right. Uh, there are so many. We can. Uh, there's an episode of itself in conspiracy, mm. conspiracies, mm. pretty much. And then uh, over on this week in sports history, we're covering covering everything that happened in the week of sports. So go check us out, Bang Dang Network, and Battles of the American Civil Wars on that network as well. And then Outlaws and Gunslingers. Go look up in your local your local podcast, <laughs> your uh, preferred podcast app, and uh, you'll find it there. We'll be back next week for. Mm. Well, whatever. We'll be back for like two or three battles. Right. Uh, battles of America Civil War. The month of Michigan is with Bang Dang.